We are live Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I have, again, special guest, Dr. James D. Tabor, joining us again. How are you, my friend? Well, other than the horrible things going on in the Middle East for the last 19 days, I'm doing okay. So, well, I'm glad and actually, some about. of that relates to what we're going to talk about, as you'll see. So yes. We I want to talk about apocalyptic scenarios that arise out of biblical texts, what people call Bible prophecy, basically. And but you're going to mainly relate it course. to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Right, right. It's related to that. Let me go ahead and get that out of the way so people understand. You have a course. This course uh, we put together here, Dr. Tabor goes deep on the Dead Sea Scrolls, gets into one of the topics we're going to talk about today, but he does so uh, extensively, bringing up sources so you can actually wrap your head around what the Dead Sea Scrolls are teaching, what's going on with this this movement 100, 150, 200 years before Jesus of Jews who are in the wilderness that have a very similar idea in many ways uh, to what we see in the New Testament. I, I wanted to ask you if that also applies to apocalypticism and what is meant by this. So everybody, um, the link is pinned at the top. It's also in the description. Go sign up for the course on Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's so much in common. There's also some differences. And wrap your head around what Dr. Tabor says here. He has a blog. He has a YouTube channel. I hope that any mods that are watching can plug his YouTube channel in the uh, chat so people can go and subscribe to Dr. Tabor. And just so you know, James, I know you already know this. And by the way, don't feel offended if you're watching. James doesn't mind me calling him James. Um, I get a lot of people who are super sensitive and saying, he's Dr. Tabor. He's Dr. J you know, trust me. He would yell at me if I kept doing about that. your royal highness. Should we go to that? <laughs> exactly? Exactly. So no, my there's students some YouTubers me out Dr. there. Dr. And Tabor, I've talked Professor about these uh, YouTubers in the past. I'll probably do some deep dives dissecting some of the sensational fear grabbing nonsense that I find among Christianity and those online that are pushing the end times are happening now. Like is the Israel conflict a sign of the end times? Proof the end times is here. What do you mean is doing? And of course, if you just type in like Hamas, Israel war, Bible prophecy, what do you know? What is that? Uh, 10 million? Was it 10 million? 6 million. 6 million. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It just, it, it's never ending with the prophecies of this and this is that. And then when Russia and then when China and then this and that, and this and that. And it's like, okay, so we need to ask first off, Dr. Tabor, Dead Sea Scrolls, your course, give us something um, about the course. And what is apocalypticism? And is this movement in the Dead Sea Scroll movement, the, the Qumran sect, we'll call them, do they have what this in common with the Jesus movement? Okay, so apocalypticism within a biblical context refers to unveiling or pulling the curtain back. And what you're pulling the curtain back on are the secrets of the end of the age, what's called eschatology. But it's particular within a Jewish context, apocalyptic messianic eschatology, because the key is a set of figures that show up most people think of one Messiah, but actually even in the New Testament, do you remember that passage in Mark? I think it's chapter 10 or so, where two of the 12 disciples, uh, the fishermen, the Zebedee boys, I call them, James and John, they say, oh, Lord, when we come into the kingdom, one of us maybe could sit at the right hand and one of the left. That's the priestly and Davidic Messiah idea that the Messiah would be the teacher like Moses. He's anointed of the Spirit. Isaiah 61, some people will know that text. The Lord has anointed me, his Spirit. Jesus quotes that in Luke 4. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have a figure. We don't know his given name, his proper name, but they called him the right teacher, the true teacher. You'll usually see it translated as the teacher of righteousness, but I, I don't think it's so much what he teaches, like I teach righteousness, because lots of teachers do that. But who is the true teacher? You know, the ultimate teacher is what they're calling him. And so 
within the Dead Sea Scrolls, we learn that, that there are actually three figures. There's a middle figure that is the main guy, and then he has two assistants, one a priest and one a Davidic warrior. And it comes up again, of course, in the New Testament. So the reason you should study the Dead Sea Scrolls, I mean, because they're the oldest documents ever found that relate to Western biblical religions, for one thing. Remember, the Dead Sea Scrolls are over 2,000 years old, the actual copies that we have, whereas copies of the New Testament are from the 4th century CE or AD, and our oldest copy of the Hebrew Bible, believe it or not, is 1,000 AD or CE. Doesn't mean it's worthless or throw it out, but to go back 2,000 years earlier and have texts that are before Jesus was even thought of or born, you know, as a human being in the earth, and to be able to study that movement. So sometimes when I teach this course to students in college and so forth, I'll even title it The First Messiah. And that's mainly an attention getter. I have to explain that because I'm teaching to Christian students primarily, or they come from Christian backgrounds. But even if they don't, they would go like, uh, you mean Jesus, right? Because this is Western culture, right? So who is the first Messiah? Well, actually, the first Messiah technically was Aaron, the priest that Moses anointed, because to be a Messiah is to be anointed either as a priest or a king. And I guess the second after him would be King Saul. Samuel anointed him as king of Israel. But when we say the first Messiah and use the M word, you know, we're not to say an anointed one way back in the time of Moses or in the time of David and Saul. We're talking about this anointed figure, anointed of the spirit, Isaiah 61, who's going to proclaim the final year of God's favor and bring in the end of the age. He's going to usher in the kingdom of God. And there are many texts in the Hebrew Bible, in the prophets particularly, some in the Psalms, but mainly, mainly the prophets, in which this figure is described and identified in terms of what he's going to do and so forth. And then you get candidates. So I like to call it categories and candidates. The categories come from the texts of the Hebrew Bible. And then you get candidates coming along, you know, almost like, I'll run, uh, could I be it, right. and so forth. So if we look at the second temple period, it's rich with candidates. Jesus is among them. Our main source is the uh, historian Josephus, who many, many of your viewers will know and probably have even read some of his works. And at my last count, he catalogs about 14 figures that come from basically the first century BCE all the way down to the Bar Kokhba period. Now, he doesn't live that far down, but he begins, he kind of stops around 70 AD. But then we have other sources that kick in. And actually, Josephus does write way into the 90s with his Jewish antiquities. So we got categories, the scriptures, candidates. What happens, though, and this is what you're going to learn in the course, are these categories, are scriptural categories, I call them floating prophecies. A good example would be Isaiah 2, well-known. The United Nations has actually put it outside on the Isaiah wall, they call it. And it says essentially that in the last days, the nations will come up to Jerusalem. They'll learn the way of peace and nations won't lift up sword against nation. There'll be no more war and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how, how would I plot that if I was wanting to know, are we near that? Are we getting near? What are the signs? That's the apocalyptic side. Well, there's no way it's a floating prophecy. You know how it begins? In the last days. Well, okay, so that kind of prophecy, these kinds of prophecies that I would call kind of set pieces, they often are just out there. And when, they, when somebody thinks the end is near, they kick in, so to speak. Now, some of them, though, get specific. For example, the day of the Lord is coming when I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Okay, that's not an exact quote, but it's Zechariah 14, Joel 3, Zechariah 12. This idea, Psalm 83, 
See, I'm I'm clicking off these little set pieces. Isn't that a category though? Like in a yeah, way, it's a category that... like uh, assault of Jerusalem in the last days by surrounding powers. Right now, if you put it in the ancient world, you see the surrounding powers will be first of all the Greeks, Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, right, Hanukkah, and all that mm -hmm. of the Maccabean period. If you go on down into the latter part of the first century, it's the Katim they're called in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's the Romans. Katim means those of the West, literally from the from Crete. They come in from the area of Crete, the Katim. If you move it on down to the time of Jesus, the Katim are still in control. And right. so they also are the ones being talked about. And so and you, you can go throughout history and then we're, throughout we throughout history. Like so what, here's what happens, and this is why everyone listening should study the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. You need more than one example. What people do is they go to the New Testament, and they tend to think, oh, this is unusual. This is unique. Mark 13, you know, I don't know of any other Jewish teacher who said this. Well, you're right if you're talking about Pharisees and Sadducees. They're the establishment. They're not into this thing. But look, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and, and by the way, we don't have any writings of Sadducees or Pharisees from this period. We have later traditions and references to them, primarily in the New Testament. And then we have the Mishnah, which is getting into the third and fourth century AD. But imagine discovering the library of a Jewish apocalyptic messianic sect 100, 150 years before Jesus, that did a, let's call it a trial run because it didn't work out to be the end, right? They thought they're going to defeat the Katim, but they quote all of the texts that the New Testament quotes having to do with this. For example, Jesus says, in those days, there will be great tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the creation and never will be again. Well, it's quoting Daniel 12, mm -hmm. verse 1. A lot of people know that. That's your floating prophecy. So, right. Okay. Well, we've had a lot of times of great tribulation in world history. But if you make it very specific and you plug in the others, oh, that's when all the armies come and conquer Jerusalem. And that's when this happens and that happens. You begin to plug all these in and you get what's called an apocalyptic scenario. Well, guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, enough of the pieces were on the chessboard of interpretation, you might say that you could begin moving them around and go, oh, well, the, the Katim, that's, that must be the Romans. And a king will come who's very evil. That must be Pompey who conquered and was very cruel and, and so forth. And you end to set up their expectations. The other thing you have is you have a timetable. It's a floating timetable. It's a final 490-year period. When you start that clock, it should the end should come within 490 years. It's also 10 jubilees, jubilees 49 years. This group, I mean, imagine we have the library of a group that thought they were in the first week of the final jubilee, which means they've got like 40 years left. So they think they're the final generation. So to have their library from that time and to be reading these texts, got a copy right here. This is the book that we use, Gaze of Vermish. It has a different cover now, but it's the same book. Now, we don't read all 683 pages, believe me. But you know what? We read, we actually read a significant portion of the important scrolls that particularly will relate to this question of Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it's like, you know, a trial run, a precursor. Uh, well, then you're going to learn from that. Because you're going to find out, like, let me just throw out a couple quotations and we could play a game. Now, you will know this, but lots of people want, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Hmm. That's Mark 14, I think, when Jesus is walking in the Kidron Valley to the Valley of Gethsemane and he's warning his disciples about the end. Really? Yeah, it's there. I can show you a text that has that 100 years before talking about the teacher of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. And it's in what's called the Damascus document. They've lost their teacher. He was killed by a wicked priest. Huh, Jesus was killed by a wicked priest. You know, it's kind of surprised me, Derek, and this is just a footnote, but 
it's funny that the mythers haven't got onto this because they're always looking for a pattern like, oh, it's Apollonius of Tyana or yeah, it's yeah. Daphnis and Chloe or it's one of these other, you know, kind of texts that I can go to and find the pattern. Well, the general Hellenistic pattern of the divine man, that works. But when you throw in this detailed apocalyptic eschatology coming from Hebrew scriptures, these Greek guys aren't reading the Hebrew Bible. We've got a group that's reading the Hebrew Bible. And they quote that about their teacher. This generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Guess what? I go to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Again, they have a document called the Community Rule. And they say from the death of the teacher, this is actually in the Damascus document, sorry. From the death of the teacher, there will pass about 40 years. See what they're saying? Because we're going to live to see the end. Yes, we lost our teacher. Now, normally when an apocalyptic group loses their teacher, you would think they would go into despair, which they often do, and they might even say we were wrong, but we know about cognitive dissonance, right? Yep. And you know what happens sometimes? They affirm it all the more. And typically what they say is somebody has seen him or heard from him, or a successor comes up with an interpretation that can adjust the, the group in some way so that they can keep waiting and expecting. Now, typically you can't do that for hundreds of years because the circumstances change so much that, I mean, you're way past 490 years. So Christians today, right now during this war, 67 during the six day war, what do they do when that clock stop ticking way back at least by the first century right final 490 year period 10 jubilees uh they go oh the clock stopped and there's seven years left so yeah. at the end of the age when all this stuff kicks in and there are millions of people out there today on youtube and everywhere else that are waiting for the the clocks like this here's midnight and and they're waiting okay get ready oh it's ticking again oh my god it's moving right. Uh, the question is, they, they, they were doing that, uh, really, it, I'll tell you, when it really begins to get re-ramped again is once Israel or the Jewish people have a homeland again, uh, the Balfour Declaration, 1917, 1920s, and so forth, uh, when the British retook uh, the Holy Land from the Ottoman Empire, but then the Six-Day War, 48, when Israel was established, there was a war. 67 is the big one because Jerusalem is now once again in the hands of Jews. So what do you do? You open up your Bible and you go, oh, Jerusalem is going to be conquered by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So now it must be fulfilled. This must be it again. Right. Now, all I say is caution lights flashing down the prophetic <laughs> highway. Okay. <laughs> caution. Ca you know, you come down a highway going too fast and you yeah. Wait, wait, be careful. There's a crash ahead. A, you're <laughs> going to go off a cliff. So, look, who am I to say what the future is? What I want people to do is study the past. Let's look at two examples where a Jewish apocalyptic messianic group, the Jesus movement and the teachers movement, I like to call it. We need to just say the teachers movement. Uh, about 100, 150 years apart, because we can't exactly date the teacher, but within 50 years we can date him, I think. And what could we learn from studying these two? Now, I heard some evangelicals recently, I've played around on YouTube, trying to, I've watched mostly news about the war. I have many friends in Israel trying to keep up. Uh, and I have, a, I have, you know, Muslim friends, Jewish friends, uh, Christian, Arab friends. I've been to the Holy Land 75 times, I think, so, and uh, know a lot of people over there. So I'm trying to keep up with it. But also, I was just cruising around on YouTube, typing in some search terms, and I just couldn't believe it. It's like, oh, it's getting replayed again. Mm -hmm. I thought it was back in 1967, which I'm old enough to remember, when the whole world thought, well, this is it, you know, and then Jerusalem was back in the hands of Israel and so forth. So you can open these texts, but what, what this these particular people were saying is, you know, when Jesus died, nobody expected him to come back. Like when a Messiah dies, that's it, right? 
So you got Simon of Perea, Judas the Galilean, Thutis, the shepherd king, and so forth. What happens? The Herod, Herod the Great kills them, or the Romans kill them, and you never hear from them again. Right. We don't have their writings. If we had their writings, let's take Judas the Galilean. What if we had documents from the Judas the Galilean movement, who was a revolt leader in 4 BC, that we think about the year Jesus was born? It maybe 5 BC was born, but 4 BC he would have been a baby. So his mother Mary certainly experienced this, and it was centered in Sepphoris, which is the urban center of Galilee, three miles from Nazareth where he grew up. So she's right there on the apocalyptic 50 yard line. If we had his writings of his followers, they might have well said the same thing. Like, I know he's dead, but I feel like, you know, he's been vindicated by God. He's going to return again. So it, this it, particular it, teacher, they were saying, no, once they die, it's over. But with Jesus, right. we had the totally unexpected event. He shows up again. James, real quick, just I this yeah. is so you just brought back a memory. I did an interview with um my buddy um uh Matthew Hartke. He he's he's a you know non-academic, but he, he dives deep, and so you can consider him like a miniature academic yeah. slash researcher. And he was looking at uh NT Wright and um some of the other claims, mainly N.T. Wright, who was trying to make this point. No one ever. We hear this often. No one ever. They didn't think they were alive after they're dead. And they give these examples from Acts. You know, we all know the famous Thutis and this and that. Yeah, right. That's what this guy did, too. He quoted Acts. Well, yeah, and he said that an early church father, I can't remember if it's Origen, who, who was one of the early church fathers. They wrote in their commentary in the Gospel of John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman. He wrote about, and we only have this. We have nothing else. There's a section where he puts in the commentary about a mess Messianic Samaritan claimant that we would not know about if it weren't for this mention by this church father who said that his followers said he's still alive to this day. And most academics place this guy a century earlier, around the first century period, and yet his claimants say he's still alive to this day. Oh, yeah. well, look, it, I know it's the pattern. What I guess what I study most, I study ancient Judaism, early Christianity. Right. But my focus is apocalypticism and particularly biblical apocalypticism through the ages. So the Dead Sea Scrolls is my springboard for getting into right. that. And I can tell you that the pattern is the opposite of what these people are saying. The pattern is... When a charismatic leader dies, the group almost invariably begins to believe that even though he's dead, yet he lives. Now, this can manifest itself in appearances, in apparitions, in dreams, in visions, even in some cases claims that someone has encountered this person. Mm -hmm. Now, this is universal. I mean, look at Apollonius of Tyana. We always mention that as an example. But the reason is because when you put all of your hopes and dreams into something like this, this is like everything, and you back it with Scripture. See, you've been studying texts of Scripture, and they're all fitting. So it has to happen, and you kick in that prophetic clock, and you don't have this little out that say, oh, the clock stops, so now we can wait 2,000 years and start it again and play it again. They didn't have that option. They're living in the 490-year period. So once it's way past it, like 80 years, 100 years, nobody's even referring to that clock anymore. But guess what? In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we don't have to speculate. We can actually find texts. The teacher of righteousness in the Thanksgiving hymns, that's a text we study. We read the whole thing in the course together. I take you through it. I guide you just like I'm giving you a commentary like a, a, a Bible teacher would do with the New Testament. I take you through the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's hymns, Thanksgiving hymns, but number 10 through number 17 were actually written by the teacher. You know what he says? Huh. He applies Isaiah 53 to himself. He does. He and, now, did the followers write that after and say that he said that? That's possible. Some people think that about Jesus. Right. You know, when Matthew says he bore our sins and 
like a lamb led to the slaughter and so forth, or Paul, Christ our Passover, sacrifice for us and so forth. But who we think the teacher wrote it because he's he's reading that text and he's thinking, that's me. I mean, I'm the one who's who's like the suffering servant leading Israel back to God. But what happens in Isaiah 53? He's despised, rejected. He makes his grave with the wicked ones. It's plural in the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way. We have a different copy of Isaiah that they used. And I will highly exalt him. Well, if you highly exalt somebody, guess what? That sounds kind of like resurrection of the dead. Right. right. I don't think in the early Christian movement, now this will surprise people who don't know my take on this, I don't think anybody was reporting a resuscitated corpse for quite some time. I think they were reporting sightings and visions initially. And I base that on the earliest and only first person account we have, and that's the Apostle Paul. And as you know, in 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Corinthians 15, when he's asked after saying, he appeared to me, I've seen the Lord, but what kind of a body? And he says, well, it's glorious, it's immortal, it's indescribable, and all of you will have that body too when you're raised. Uh, but he says he, he, he can't describe it in physical terms, that it's, God will, will create the spiritual body that Jesus now has. And so I think the corpse idea uh, basically comes later. We don't even get it in Mark. And even in Matthew, I'm not sure we get it because... Uh, Remember, they're on a mountain mm -hmm. in the Galilee. And it's like an apparition, yeah. It sounds kind of like a misty, I always pictured as a misty, cloudy mountain. And then it says he appeared to them. Even in some of the movies I've seen, it's kind of like a light in the sky speaking to them. Have you noticed right. that in some of the Jesus yeah, movies? Yeah, yeah. They don't really, because they, they want to make him kind of glorified. And then they hear a voice and he says, go into all the world and preach the God, you know, and they think, yeah. And then, but then Matthew has the honesty, maybe to say, but some doubted. Right, right. So that's among the eleven. It's the eleven left after Judas is gone. Uh, you know, so by studying the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can begin to see. Uh, for example, they say this is the time for preparing the way in the wilderness. That's my favorite, mm -hmm. Isaiah forty verse three. This is the time. Okay. 150 years later, John the Baptist. This is the time for preparing <laughs> the way in the wilderness. Quotes the exact same verse. Now, I'm not just saying, oh, look how stupid all these people were. They keep applying this and they're all wrong. That's not my point. My point is an apocalyptic messianic movement of any time or period that relies on these texts. You need to say almost like buyer beware, you know, uh, don't go for it necessarily until you've got a little history under your belt. And I think we're in a time now of, I mean, look how the world is divided. We've got Russia and China and the Ukraine, and we've, we've got the democracies against the totalitarian regimes. We've got divisions in our country between the Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in apocalyptic times. We've got climate change. We've got all these things, economic possibilities, doomsday weapons. <laughs> so of course you can open these books and say, well, this has to be it. But just remember people in the past also thought this has to be it Yeah, because they too could tick off the things that were happening. So, so James, I would, even if somebody's listening and they think, um, well, Dr. Tabor, I think it fits more today. And these people, you know, they they just thought it was and it wasn't. Well, that could well be true. But it still makes sense to learn from the past. OK, and we should look at how these have been interpreted in the two examples that we have. And these are the only two examples we have from the ancient world, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jesus movement. But it's like we got the New Testament and we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Let's compare them. Let's learn a lot. Before we before we get to my one big question <clears throat> that I'd like to tease the audience with, I do want to give a, a, a promo real quick about the course, just for those who are viewing and, and checking us out right now. Um, 
this Sunday. So if you sign up for Dr. James D. Tabor's Dead Sea Scroll, Jesus in the Dead Sea Scroll course, you're going to learn a lot you did not know about the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is so much material here. It's all in 4K, really high quality. Um, you're getting several lectures. We're 10 lectures, bonus footage of us actually there in Qumran. We're in, uh, where, what is the place that we are particularly at that we filmed that you were talking in Qumran? Right at Cave 4, I think, and also the cemetery. I think you've got, oh, the, well, the uh, mikvah that's there. We we kind of walk through the site. Right. We've also got some bonus videos. You you get a study packet that's about 40 pages, PDF. You get all of this other PDF download material. It's over 100 pages. It's really in-depth. Uh, the Mark course, I'm proud of it, and it's wonderful, and a lot of people uh, watching will have taken that. But in terms of study, well, that was only one text, you understand? We're doing like the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this course actually has a lot more in it in terms of just content because of the nature of what we're studying. Now this Sunday, like, we're doing a comp, we're, we're actually gonna be doing a Zoom call for all students who sign up for this course. I will be there this Sunday with you, Dr. Tabor. And yep. what can people expect before I get my one question uh, asked okay. of you? Uh, the thing that I do, I did it with the Mark course too. We met for six months, uh, the last Sunday of the month, unless it's some special holiday or something. And we, we meet at noon on Zoom. And this is not a webinar. I want to explain that because everybody does webinars. That's where you sign in to a website on Zoom and you hear a guy talking for 30 minutes and sometimes questions get passed on or something. No, this is like, I call it a Zoom room. I taught on Zoom during COVID, so I know how to do this. We get everybody together. It's 50 people a screen. So I remember on the Mark course, we had over 200. Remember on that first meeting yeah, that yeah. you and I did? I was turning the screen off. and there were several and, pages. And yet, as when somebody talks, they pop to the front and so forth. And I know you can't have a, it's not the same as sitting around in a seminar with 12 people. But you know what? There is a personal touch, wouldn't you say, Derek? I, I mean, you look at the people and people raise their hand and people can ask questions, uh, especially as we go on, because we're going to keep doing this for several months. Uh, but in the first one, we're going to have prepared Q&A. So if you sign up for the course, you can message me. And I I'll, I don't know if my email is in the course, but we'll put it in if it isn't. But I send out an email to all the registered people. It already went yesterday to the ones so far. Yeah. But that doesn't mean if you sign up today or all the way through Saturday night, I'd say. If you get wait till Sunday, it's getting kind of close. But Theoretically, we're going to put the link on the course page. So even if you signed up, signed up at Sunday morning at noon, you could jump into the Zoom meeting. You haven't even looked at the course yet, you know, because the link will be there. It's just for you as a student. And I've already been getting questions, great questions from people. The course has been out over a month now. And you're not going to believe, Derek. I haven't seen Der Derek's going to be my MC on the question. You're not going to believe the how good these students are. Really, we have got some incredible students, and they ask the best questions. And what's so great is you're talking not just a general audience. You're talking to a group that's read the scrolls and studied right. the scrolls, or at least is in the process. And then as we go through subsequent months, I get to know you. Uh, you know, and people keep sending questions and we kind of form different kinds of uh, the Dead Sea Scroll called it the Yakad, a kind of a, a group, a community, you know, it's sort of a community of people studying the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I don't know if anybody else does this, but I, I love doing it. It's great. Yeah, you, yeah. you have a unique, me and Ryan, you know, the queen of myth vision. We talk about it all the time. Uh, you'll send these messages as me and her at the gym in the morning, trying to get our exercise, trying to look good and fit. And and um, and you'll send these messages. And I'm like, James is very unique. I mean, we have several scholars, you know, who who participate on MVP courses and you're unique. You want to connect and stay connected, keep the family tight. So 
I really do appreciate that about you because I know a lot of people appreciate that. It's something about having that sense of community and being connected and learning directly from a professor such as yourself who's been teaching over 40 years. You know, you've been doing this stuff for a long time. And we have new scrolls. There are new scrolls out. <laughs> and I'm actually now because of the war taking a look at some things about the Katim again that I want to bring out on Sunday because, you know, we don't live in a vacuum, right? And if there's a war going on in the Middle East and we're studying the first messianic movement that thought their war was the war, mm -hmm. you can see how I'm going to be able to draw some relevant lessons, even in terms of what's happening today. So I think that's going to be really interesting for people. And Derek, as we go on, later months having these Zoom meetings, um, and I know every, all teachers say this, it's kind of lip service, like, oh, I learn a lot from my students, or I've heard, I learn as much from my students as I do from my study. Well, I don't know that that's true, but guess what? A lot of the people that follow you, Derek, do you know how many religious experiences and traditions they've been through? Do you, mm -hmm. many, you know how many books they've read? how many articles, how many YouTube videos. I would say the average one has read hundreds of things, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. They don't just wander in like, oh, I guess I might look at some religion. No, they're speakers. <laughs> They've been digging. A lot of them have read the whole New Testament and tried to figure stuff out, and they've listened to all this stuff. So it's an honor for me to be with these students, and I mean that sincerely because I like to meet with a group of historical seekers mm. that are trying to figure stuff out. And you know what? Many eyes see things that two eyes never see. Just think about it. Somebody's gonna spot something. We're going through the Damascus document. Somebody goes, but Dr. Tabor, look at column six, line three. And I go, you know, I've never noticed that before. Happens all the time. I want students to come in with me yeah. And have a class. So. You know, there's two things that you remind me of. One is Steve Mason's remarks about Myth Vision. The first week he ever did a live stream, he was just like, man, I've had more people voluntarily want to watch this four hour live stream. I've talked to more people that way than I've <laughs> ever taught teaching in college. Number one. Number two, <laughs> It reminded me of a debate that took place between Christine Hayes and an Orthodox rabbi about the Mishnah and Talmud. And the rabbi is like, no, you got to read this for like uh, for, for moral instruction. Don't read this for the who, what, when, where, and why. And the way that Christine Hayes painted it, I, I, I relate to what she said. She said to the rabbi, my friend, listen, your religious experience is through that. I get what you could call a so-called religious experience that experience you get through the historical analysis, through the who, the what, the why did the rabbi say that? What did they mean when they said this? There's something cool that goes beyond the, mm -hmm. the what I once thought, even as a person who's not a Christian anymore. Like I still get an amazing experience exploring the historical relationship that humans had and why they did this and why these texts were written. There's something cool about that. It's called enlightenment, Derek, right? The lights go on. I go, enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Maybe you've only studied the New Testament, and then you're going to read these scrolls, and constantly you're going to say, oh, my God, I had no idea. This has already been thoroughly discussed. Now, I'm not, it, it might sound like we're both saying the scrolls, the scroll movement and the Jesus movement are the same. No, we go into the differences. Mm -hmm. No two apocalyptic groups are ever the same. And even the Jesus movement, I mean, is it monolithic? Are you kidding me? I'm not sure Paul even liked Peter and James. Uh, you know, uh, he calls them the so-called pillars of the church. That's not a real nice way to refer to You're the so leaders in Jerusalem. Scholar, James. Yeah. What? Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, you and are. As far as the thing about the students, uh, I know this sounds like I'm putting down my college students, but my undergrads at UNC Charlotte, all the years I taught, 33 years there, if I'm in an advanced seminar, they can get pretty good, like I expect in this course. You know, they really study. But the average class, let's say I have a class of 50 and we just do apocalypticism or whatever, mm -hmm. their main question is, ready? 
Will that be on the test? You've heard that. That's a joke now. Will this be on the test? <laughs> and do we really have to read that? And they don't ever say that because I tell them they have to. But what they think is, I'll just listen to Tabor in class because he goes over it anyway. See, well, I don't think the people that sign up for this course have that attitude. If anything, they're like, I'm not going to fall for something. I want to read you mentioned the Damascus document. I'm going to read the Damascus document so that when you talk about it, I have read it. Mm -hmm. And and it, it's just tremendous. There's there's just so many things. I'm so excited about it, as you can tell. Absolutely. It, so sign up today. La my one question, and then if you don't mind, James, can we touch a few super chats if you have the Absolutely, time? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Try to try to make it relevant to this, right. but. Uh, I'm pretty good at answering questions. I can always like side step it or whatever. Yeah, let's do it. Why not? Uh, one of the big questions I had was we're, we're looking for commonality between these apocalyptic movements. We've described apocalypticism as like the unveiling. Um, you, I don't even want to get into Jonathan Z. Smith because obviously you know uh, everything he put out when it comes to this. He's what a God he was in the field in terms of uh, the research on here. But, um, as far as the end of the age, this term is used in the Gospels describing the end of the age. What was meant by the Dead Sea Scroll community by end of the age? Can you tease us? Um, and of course, people should sign up for the course to get more in depth here. But it part of the challenge of the course is figuring out some of that because remember the movement goes over about a 50 to 100 year period so we see their development mm -hmm. and just like in the new testament if you ask paul for example our earliest source just to give you a parallel okay paul jesus is going to come back the dead will rise and meet him and the living will rise and then the kingdom is going to come uh, describe that to me. It's not real clear. Does he have a kind of millennial view? Is it the kingdom of God on earth, sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel, that kind of thing, like you get in the, the two saying source of the Gospels, sometimes called Q. You know, what is the vision of the future? Mm -hmm. uh, but we do get hints. They definitely are looking for the a fairly literal description of the uh, prophetic fulfillment in other words when they mentioned the katim are going to come and uh invade and there'll be a time of trouble and the shepherd's going to be struck and so forth they they think that's happening and is going to happen even further so it's not a metaphor for like well evil is besetting us all the time so maybe you're a team or some of the demons you're struggling with in your life no they, they never go there no this is talking about armies this is talking about actual battles taking place now here's the part that begins to get slippery if i'm a messianic figure like i think jesus of nazareth was and i believe pretty literally in you know sitting on a throne and all the nations gathered in some sort of a judgment and so forth, the way the prophets describe, like Zechariah 14. And Jesus quotes Zechariah 14. In that day, there will mean no traitor in the house of the Lord. T-R-A-D-E-R. -E what does he do? He cleans out the traders, right? The people, the money changers. So that kind of fulfillment is pretty literal. But he also says, hold it. Don't fight, you guys. I can call 12 legions of angels if I need them. Now, I know that's a presentation of Matthew in that case. Remember, he says, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Right. Uh, so I don't want to confuse Matthew with the historical Jesus. But the ideas, I think, are also found in the lifetime of Jesus himself. And that is, how much does God do in a kind of transcendent way? And then what do humans experience as they try to follow the will of God. So it's kind of something like there can be a real battle. I mean, battle with weapons and blood and corpses and burial, like read Ezekiel 38 and 9, that describe the wars of Gog and Magog and so forth. Book of Revelation, the blood is up to the bridle of the horses and so forth. Uh, that sounds pretty real. And I don't think that's talking about the uh, threat of evil throughout history and some allegory. 
characterization of that. I don't think they, I don't think the writers of the book of Revelation meant it that way. But on the other hand, uh, Jesus probably expected in the future, those Katim have to be defeated. The earth doesn't disappear, right? And the Romans just don't go away. So there is this idea that the suffering that Jesus began to anticipate is a redemptive suffering. Paul had the same idea, right? And there's you turn the other cheek. It, it's the ethic of uh, not so much people call it being a pacifist. It's, it's really not a pacifist. It's more vengeance belongs to God, not to me. And my job or, or my role is to submit to the will of God. And that's what Jesus does according to the Gospels in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I think they are expecting a concrete, real future, and it's not end of the world. End of the world is a terrible mistranslation of, you know, that phrase uh, It's used in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's also used, uh, they, they talk about this age and the age to come, mm -hmm. the close of the age, the last days, and so forth. So they're reading things fairly literally, but with God on their side, if you know what I mean. So maybe they thought, like, I get the idea, there, there's a scroll called The War of the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness, okay? That's the name of the scroll. So it's a war. But as you begin to read how that war is going to take place, they get so much supernatural help that it seems like it's not like a normal war, because who could defeat the Romans? Give me a break. You know, 24 legions, you're really going to beat them? I don't think so. But they believe God will give them the victory, you see. But it's still a war, and they're preparing. Like, they're getting their banners together and their weapons and so forth, as they describe it. Hmm. So it's hard to know sometimes, just like in any text, you know, how literal do you take the literal? But I don't think it's ever, never, never land. I think it is here and now. It is naming definite powers that they faced in their time, just like the book of Revelation talks about their 10 kings, five have fallen, one is, one is to come, and so forth. These are probably Roman emperors, including Nero, we think. You know, these are real people, but they're going to get defeated by God. So Vesuvius would be a great example, right? 79 AD, summer of 79, you get a volcano that they thought was going to destroy Rome. Plenty the elder is burnt up in the fire. His nephew, Plenty the younger, is in a ship watching, you know, Pompeii and Herculaneum go down. And they probably thought, you know, this is it. Everybody's been predicting the final judgment. Read Revelation 19, Derek. I think we did a show on this once. Revelation 19. No, I'm sorry, Revelation 18. 19 is when it's all over. Read Revelation 18. The city's burning. The ships are in the harbor. They're crying, oh, great Babylon, all of the trade and the whole world, you know, that kind of thing. So imagine 9-11 or something like that being right. described. And people that think the United States is Babylon, they would be thinking, yeah, God's bringing them down through their own enemies or something like that. But, I mean, you still have to wake up in the morning and decide whether to make coffee or not or what. You're not in Never Never Land, so to speak. So I don't know if that addresses it. but There's uh, a lot. Yeah, there's they a lot. They do think there. there's eternal life. They do, they do talk about being back in an Edenic state of some type. But they never talk about flying off to heaven or anything like that. So Yeah that that was it's one of those interesting things you know i came from the preterist background but let's get to super chats because we'll i'll never get uh to people's uh questions here if i okay, don't let's go for it okay Con constellation pegasus thank you so much yesterday you super chatted us and we were tearing just like jesus so um <laughs> here we are today any topic ideas for any courses in the future the way i understood this question james is um we did mark we did Jesus in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. So you want to tease a few of our, uh, like for future. Yeah, I've got a bunch of ideas. I think I'm going to do one. I'm not sure if this will be the next one, but I have two in mind. One is discovering the real Paul. You know how we do historical Jesus? I'd like to do historical Paul. And that Paul's the figure I've worked on the most. I've written two books on Paul. You can put the links in the description 
just right. go to my blog, has it all, jamesdaver.com. But I, I think I want to do that. And that would be just like I'm teaching the scrolls and Mark. Look, for years, I've taken people verse by verse through the seven letters of Paul, the authentic letters of Paul. I don't know anybody that isn't in a college course that has a chance to do that. And I think I'd like to do a course. We we could do it probably in about 10 or 12 lessons. And we just go through the letters of Paul. I'd be really. And excited. I give you the benefit of what I've learned over the years. And then we can touch on all the issues that people bring up in Pauline studies. And I think that would be a course that a lot of people would want to take. It, it's sort of like Sunday really school with James Tabor. <laughs> you know? I, this is, yeah. yeah. Look, the other one that really got me teased, you know me, I came from that kind of, I thought the end of the world was going to happen as a Christian. And then I started realizing, hold mm -hmm. on, there's certain time statements in the New Testament yep. that make it seem like it was supposed to happen soon. Then I rationalized and became a full preterist for a while because I could not accept failure. Um, yep. And so... Anyway, later on, I ended up realizing, whoa, there's a reason critical scholars think that it didn't happen. Um, and so the one that you really got me hype on thinking is going through history and yep. documenting all of the apocalyptic movements that had an eschatology that failed. Yep. And mm -hmm. just tease everybody, there's a 100% success rate on them all failing. And so going through history, documenting Sabotai Zevi, you know, Millerites, like going way, way back in history. Yeah, apocalypticism through the ages, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I teach that course already, and I, that, that's another one. A third one is uh, I think I would like an, I'd like a group to attempt with me to restore an original primitive gospel that is recoverable from the text that we have in the synoptic gospels. Um, I'm not going to call it Q, although the Q material is part of it, but how do you go about maybe reconstructing the earliest stage of, of the Jesus story? Mark's our earliest finished product, and we did a course on that. But uh, what about all the teachings of Jesus that are like in Luke and Matthew and so forth? So, uh, and that this would be an experimental course where we try to do it together. You know, I would suggest things and we would explore them and so forth. It, it would have a little more of an interactive, uh, but kind of like restoring the original gospel. All the things that people are doing on Marcion's text, we have yeah. several scholars working on that, Mark Bilby and Jason and others that are looking at some of that, Jason DeBoon. Um, that that could play into it. But like Bert Mack wrote a book long ago called uh, something like the Q, the Q Gospel Restored or whatever. Different people have tried it. Uh, McDonald, uh, I think, doesn't Dennis? Uh, he has his idea of uh, some original Q document. I'd like to uh, synthesize those in some way and try to get it down to method. Like what methods do you use? Not just like, well, this is what I come up with and I'm going to stick with it, right. <laughs> you know, but more, how do you decide these things? Those criteria of authenticity, I think most of us agree, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. They're too subjective. Yeah, you know, you, you've talked about those before with other scholars, you know, right. you think, well, there's four criteria will apply. And Crossan probably does the best job in trying to do it, but he comes up with a non-apocalyptic Jesus. So, you know, my buzzer is going to go, nah, wait, wait. That's what, what I did. What happened? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dale Allison is my favorite of all favorites. I think he does the best job on reconstructing the historical Jesus. Paula Friedrichsen, I think, does a tremendous job. Uh, we might even take scholars. I hadn't thought of this, Derek. We might take a set of scholars, examine what each, you had a course, Dale gives a course. And people maybe that took his course, uh, we would then do a Dale Allison segment or two. Why does he end up differing from Crossan? Right. And you know what we might even do is talk them into coming into a Zoom later after we've all done the work. Wouldn't that be something? 
and they would be they'd be so excited about it because there's there would be students that have actually studied their stuff you know yeah and then talking about oh wow how do we do this you know so i know he'd be down absolutely yeah, yeah. thank you Ro uh, rochester johnny thank you for the support my friend yesterday you were showing love and you super chatted in case you're here uh if you're not here you might see this later thank you so much constellation again says any book recommendations for this topic time period this hits the stage so i think it's the uh the topic of a failed apocalypticism uh, the dead sea scrolls and we compare it to the mm, Jesus. i have i have a number of uh i'm, I'm not sure if he or she, constellation pegasus is, is that a guy or a girl i don't want to assume <laughs> do you know I started to say he, but right. Con I'll just say the name. I know, I know this person from many super chats in the past. But anyway, if the person means for the time period, I would, I would uh, probably think of something like, um, let's see, from the Maccabees to the Mishnah. It's a study of Judaism, and I'm trying to think who wrote it. You might have to Google it for me to see it. But that would be a good survey of the period, and that takes you from the Maccabees all the way through the Mishnah. Um, but I can't remember now who wrote that offhand. haven't looked at it in a while because I usually don't go into survey books that much. For the Dead Sea Scrolls, I would say Michael Wise, The First Messiah. Tremendous book. And... Uh, so as far as prophecy through the ages, uh, there are quite a few. Probably the best thing is the Oxford Handbook on Millennialism, which is a big, thick encyclopedia-type book. But that covers not just biblical, but, you know, Japanese, uh, Asian, Buddhist, and all kinds of views. Anybody that has a sort of future utopian hope Mm -hmm. and thinks there's some way to predict when it's coming. Um, so, but I do have a bibliography. There is a bibliography in the uh, course pack with lots of further reading. Thank you. Thank I you. Hope, hope that JC is. has one of two super chats yesterday. Um, as the presence of certain names on the Talpiat tomb ossuaries raises a statistical question, what question is raised by the presence of saffron rosette Rosettas on those ossuaries, along with the presence of cognates to the roots of the names Joshua, Ephraim, Ephrata, and Joseph in the cuneiform words that refer to the flower that is represented by the star David. Holy smokes. You know, that has to do with the uh, ornamentation. Some people call it decorations on ossuaries. The best source for that and I don't know if it's going to tell you much about cuneiform, but it's E.R. Good Enough. His name is actually Good Enough. E.R. Good Enough. <laughs> the famous scholar at Yale. He would be the Jonathan Smith of his day. Ooh. Jonathan Smith was my teacher on Hellenistic religions. And he wrote the big multivolume thing is probably too much to buy but there's a one volume edition and it's on jewish symbols he goes with the route that they're full of deep meaning symbolic meaning and it's not just you go to the ossuary shop and you kind of like i like a one with that pattern and i kind of like that pattern that looks really pretty i'll take <laughs> that you know something like that but it, but people are trying to say something very profound I tend right. to lean with both, meaning some people might just go with the flow, like you do funeral, funerary practices in every culture have a certain pattern to them that people go with. Uh, but if you, when you're decorating the bone box for the deceased, I don't think it tends to be haphazard. Uh, I think uh, people, there's a lot of uniformity to it, but there are also a lot of anomalies. But as far as the roots of the names, um, let's see. Should I read the first half again? No, I the think there's names on the copy to know the statistical um, question. What question? I haven't studied. I haven't studied that in terms of uh, the cuneiform words, 
that refer to that saffron flower. Um, clearly, art history overlaps in various ways. To me, words like Joshua are pretty straightforward. It, it's form, you know, basically from the name Jehovah or God or Yahweh, and to save. So Jehovah saves. Yehoshua literally means Yehovah saves. So, uh, so I don't get some deep meaning in there, but not sure. Thanks. Okay. For R Rhonda has gained true salvation through Myth Vision. Thanks for joining the member program. Really appreciate it, Rhonda. Thank you so much for joining the family. Doc Pleromina, you know when Doc's name comes up, it's oh, going to yeah. have like someone's my favorite. Yeah. thesis. <laughs> How different would the paradigm of early Dead Sea Scrolls scholarship be if the Halakhic scrolls, Q4, MMT, etc., were found first rather than doctrinal text? were universally available and Jewish scholars had access. Yeah, we uh, we tend in the course, Doc, to look at the history of ideas, you could call it doctrinal text, uh, because we're dealing with charter membership and how you get in and how you stay in and what the beliefs are and so forth, because I want to compare it to early Christianity. The Halakhic scrolls... Um, are very, very important because they help us to try to understand what the relationship was in interpreting the Torah, particularly laws of purity in the temple, that to this group would be a very big deal. Uh, in the course, one of the things I cover is what do you do with the toilets or the latrines? Uh, because the Torah says to put them outside the camp and bury your, your waste, your feces, to bury it, right? Okay. And in city of Jerusalem, there are toilets, you know, and people have toilets in their home. They don't all walk out of the city to go to the bathroom. Well, that's a big deal to the Dead Sea Scroll community because in the Torah, it also says that God's presence cannot be in a place that has human waste. It's not that human waste is ritually defiling, because it isn't. Uh, Jody Magnus has a great article on this. Uh, so if I touch a dead body, that's ritually defiling. If I have sexual intercourse, that's ritually defiling. doesn't mean it's dirty. If I'm a woman and I have a period, that's ritually defiling. But the toilet thing is a different question. It has to do with the holiness that's in, in the camp and what's appropriate for the presence of God during worship. And what this group believes is that, is that angels hover over the assembly when they gather together on Shabbat, the Sabbath, and on the festivals. Also, it has to be on the right day according to the calendar. So if you're meeting on a Yom Kippur that's not really Yom Kippur, according to this group, and the Pharisees are meeting in Jerusalem on another Yom Kippur, that comes up in the scrolls because the wicked priest comes down on Yom Kippur for the teacher and it confronts him because he knows the teacher can't do anything on Yom Kippur. Does that recall the 1973 war when the Arabs attacked uh, the Jews on Yom Kippur? Now it's because not a holy day in Islam, we can go kill Jews. Uh, and if you've seen that new movie out, Golda, it's about 50 years ago to the day from the October uh, attack was uh, the attack of Yom Kippur. So sometimes halakhic stuff can have to do not just with what Paul calls touch not, taste not, handle not, you know, like, ooh, ritual defilement, I can't go to the temple. It can also have to do with what allows the presence of God to come in. So we think they're a celibate community in Qumran itself. Why? Because sexual intercourse can keep the presence of God away. And the best way to keep the presence of, the best way to not to be defiled sexually is just don't have women in that community. But the group does allow marriage and having children and people who do get married. So it's more like, a kind of spiritual headquarters, like a monastery you would go to, you know, a Buddhist monastery, 
and you could even be married, but you're in the monastery for special devotion and uh, spiritual discipline and so forth. The problem with 4Q MMT, which is this halakhic document that we have, and there are others too, that's not the only one, is we're not sure who wrote it and to who is it actually addressing. It's, a, it's kind of a question because it, both have been argued. Some have argued that it's, it's a group writing to the scroll group telling them, here's what we think. Most of us think it's the scroll group writing to the Jerusalem people and saying, here's what you need to clean up in your own religious practices. Halakhic, by the way, means the way you observe the Torah in, in, very strict, in, a, in a very strict way down to what regulations. So let's say if you spit in the assembly, uh, you know, like you're, you got to cough and spit, or let's say your robe comes open, and your genitals are exposed in the assembly. Uh, what what happens? That's addressed in the scrolls. I really don't think the Pharisees would particularly probably even address something like that. Hmm. Uh, so uh, it's a good question, though. The balance between Jewish observance, just like today with Orthodox observant Jews, and Jewish ideas that they hold, and how those two go together. There's such a thing as being orthopraxic, which means you follow the rules of your group, but then your ideas could, could range from reincarnation to no reincarnation to eschatology to this idea to that idea. I think this group is pretty monolithic. I, I get the idea that they run a tight ship. They think that their teacher has all true revelation. He's the new Moses, basically. So. Thank you. Mr. Brain Ache, thank you for the super chat. If K4 was a Geniza and the community were working from old scrolls, wouldn't that put them in the time of Jesus? Well, whether it was a Geniza or not is a question. Uh, the way they've been found all on the floor of the cave, it's been extensively discussed. Uh, might indicate that because in a Geniza, you, a Geniza is where you put old, worn out scrolls. But all of the K4 material doesn't look old and worn out. It's been deteriorated by weather, by moisture, and most of all by varmints that have gotten in there and like chewed the stuff mm -hmm. because leather is edible, you know. Uh, it is an organic uh, substance. And these are on leather primarily, not parchment or papyri. A parchment is like a cured leather that I guess a self-respecting mouse might not want to eat. But leather, we've had at our house here a couple of leather coats ruined by mice hmm. uh, in an attic once. And uh, it's because, you know, they, they like the leather. so Or maybe they like the dye in the leather. I don't know. But uh, so I'm not sure it is a Geniza. But it doesn't put them... Uh, well, let me put it this way. As far as being written in the time of Jesus, I don't think. But as far as them existing on down into the time of Jesus, uh, yes. Uh, this group was active, as far as we know, right up until the year 70. And we think they were, they fled the community uh, when the 10th Legion had destroyed Jerusalem in the summer of 70 and came down and burnt the palace of Jericho. Herod's palace at Jericho, and then came on down and ended up at uh, Masada. So the, if the theory is right that they hid their scrolls at that time, uh, and that it wasn't a Geniza, then they would have hidden scrolls that date back even earlier. There has been carbon dating of some of the scrolls, and most of it comes out to be first century BCE. I think there's one or two texts that are from the first century CE. I'm not much convinced by the Geniza theory uh, because it looks like there might be, have been shelves or something. Remember, scrolls are very light. They're just rolls. And uh, that, that maybe they all collapsed and everything then is just topsy-turvy. But, you know, I wish we had better records of the, you know, if we had photos, what did cave four look like on the day 
that the uh, scholars first looked at it and before they removed anything. And I believe Westerners did discover K4 rather than the Bedouin. But you never know with the Bedouin because sometimes they'll discover a cave and take some things out. And then later, the they, these were Jordanian scholars and some uh, Catholic scholars from Jerusalem who were coming down mm -hmm. to find more scrolls, fa uh, Father DeVoe and so forth. Uh, but that's the kind of question we can discuss in the course. We can talk yeah. about that. And I, I have articles on that. Whether Were the scrolls of Geniza? We have whole articles on that. Thank you. Thank you. JC has another few interesting questions. Um, is donkey riding in the Bible an act of performative humility alongside the ancient Near Eastern custom of deities, kings, and their chariots as the burden of asses? Yeah, that comes up a lot when there's a prophecy in Zechariah 9, verse 9, I think, about, lo, your king comes to you humble and triumphant, and he's riding on an ass. And there is that text. I believe it's Solomon who's anointed as king at the foot of the Kidron by the Gihon Spring. And I believe he's pictured as riding on a donkey. I don't know if it's exactly humility, not coming in, riding a war horse, like, say, Revelation chapter 19, the white horse with somebody riding it. I think it's in your trailer, right, of somebody riding a white horse. Yeah. I'm not sure who that person is, but... Uh, I, I, I would never know. I could never yeah. figure out who that person is. No, he has a white beard and white hair, but... <laughs> I, you know, when we go to do the outro, we'll play that for we'll people. Play that and people can decide who that is and be sure and look for Robin somewhere on one of those horses. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. I um, do know that what I do find interesting about the whole uh, riding on asses is Dionysus does the same thing. So there's, yeah. there's an interesting something to do with asses. JC also asks another question. I think the sense of salvation in the name of Yeshua is derived from the Asu of Asupiro, Piru, healing branch. The root of Joshua is the Asu of Saffron. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my sense of Hebrew, and Greek's my best language. I majored in Greek. My Hebrew is pretty good. But um, if you're going to take that kind of etymology or that kind of derivation of names, you would have to, it seems to me, you'd have to leave behind what the words come to mean uh, from at least 5th, 6th, 7th century BC in the text that we have, because clearly you've got the yod heh vav -He as part of these names, many of these names, and then you've got verbs like to save. And it's not any holy word or anything. It, if I almost drop this book in a fire, and I'm speaking Hebrew, anciently even, and I and I grab it out, and then Derek says to me in Hebrew, oh my God, you saved the book. He would use the same word, saved, as you need to get your soul saved, like a Christian evangelical preacher might mean it. So it just, I, I'm not familiar with the kind of thing that JC's trying to do there mm -hmm. in terms of the language. Um, but most Hebrew names are pretty, some of them aren't, but most of them are pretty self-evident and they're made up of a couple of roots in Hebrew, sometimes one or two put together. And that's just what they mean. So. Thank you. Okay. Shameless plug here. This Sunday, we are doing a Zoom call. Hope to see you there. Um, obviously we'll be discussing what you learn in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you could sign up for the course now. There's 10 lectures. There's also bonus footage, lots of information, uh, packets to read from. Uh, you'll really walk away having a better grasp of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how to understand those from Dr. Tabor. You can also go and sign up for his blog. So you go over here and say, I'm not a robot, unless you are a robot. If you're a mm -hmm. robot, you know. Don't click I'm not a robot. But if you aren't a robot, click I'm not a robot. Put your email in there and go ahead and subscribe over there. He's always dropping some interesting stuff. Uh, recently, his uh, se the second largest interview on Bart Ehrman's uh, podcast is the one with Dr. Tabor. So 
I usually I usually don't like to brag, but I had to brag on that one. So you had to brag on that one. You also got the YouTube channel, so people can go subscribe. You're almost at fifty thousand. Yeah, I'd like to hit it today. Let's pump Help those me. numbers up. Let's get those numbers up. Get it fifty k. Um, what was I when I met you? I think I was three thousand, wasn't I? <laughs> Something like that. Three I or think four thousand. Yeah, it was really small, really small. And you've come. So I thought that was big though back then. Thought three thousand people want to hear me? Wow! <laughs> Let me. Um, yeah, I have one video that has like eight hundred thousand views, and I'm still trying to figure out how that could be. But <laughs> did somebody just sit there all day? As Bart said, I know I paid my relatives to do it for hours, but eight hundred thousand—that seems like a lot. That was I'm a joke. starting a poll just giving people a few minutes just to be able to i'd like to know anyone in the chat who signed up for the dead sea scroll course so if you have if you haven't no judgment let us know where you're at on that if you signed up for it and um i'm looking forward to it james because my hopes are people enjoy learning these things from you and then you're motivated and saying okay there's lots of students people really do want this i'll i'll make more courses we'll do more deep dives into several different avenues of material that's my hope so we did get a super chat you want to hit that and then we can come back and see what the votes are at yeah okay sure. here we go atif uh bengesh forgive me if i butchered your name i am a thief who came at night and stole his mother's heart that day storm tip came from the east it was october 12th 1979 who am i his kingdom is in the clouds soon to be revealed I don't know. Hmm. Help me out. <laughs> I don't know. Anyone know the answer to this? I mean, it sounds very Jesus-y. Uh, you know, his kingdom's in the clouds, that kind of stuff. Uh, but as far as... 1979. Yeah. I don't remember that as a date, a big date for... Uh, I'm trying to think. <laughs> we got 79. Someone said Jim Jones. <laughs> uh, I think Jim Jones was 79, maybe. Not sure. Vrian says I, that is a riddle I cannot solve. <laughs> Help us well, out. Is Atif going to tell us? Or do yeah, we have to, tell us the answer. We have to pay him $10. Someone tell us the answer here. All right. Um, make sure you voted. I'm giving you five seconds. Five, four, Three, you know, there's a delay, by the way. Two, one. Did you vote? How many people you got out there, Derek? Well, I'm about to end the poll. I just wanted people to be able to get their mm -hmm. vote in to before because there's a small delay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and do it now. So I hope everybody voted. I see the, the toll changing each second. So, all right, here we go. Here we go. In poll. Sorry, you didn't make it in the kingdom. Now you're going to be out the, on the outside banging on the gate doors. All right. It says, have you signed up for the for Jesus and the Dead Sea Scroll course? 62% said no. Um, and 37% said yes. Uh, there's only 27 votes. So it wasn't a lot. That's Not great. Many voted. So we'll see you Sunday. It's noon Eastern. Um, we had to pick a time. It's never perfect for people. Uh, you you could cynically say, yeah, what did you try to hit the church time? This is when Christians go to lunch after services, right? <laughs> to the cafeterias or something. But it really has to do with trying to pick a time that can fit people worldwide to some degree. And Sunday is more likely a day off than Saturday for people. So that was kind of how we chose that. And it's worked pretty well. How did James, his Jewish movement disappeared, and what happened to the Jews, Jewish followers of Jesus? Oh, yeah, that's a great one. Well, we can trace them for quite a while. Um, they, they, they were across the Jordan on the east side for a while. Uh, some church fathers that hate them uh, track them for us, Jerome particularly, Epiphanius, uh, 4th and 5th century fathers. So they're considered heretics. They call them Ebionites. We think that they, some of them end up in Arabia 
and had a tremendous influence on Islam. Uh, it makes Muslims very upset to mention this because if they're very fundamentalist, they would say that the Quran and Muhammad have no historical influences whatsoever because the angel Gabriel doesn't go by what some Ebionites believed. Right. But we can find elements of uh, Ebionite ideas within Islam, particularly the idea of uh, praying toward Jerusalem and the Sabbath being a holy day. And we do know there were Jewish communities, but there are also some elements of Islam, some of the tales and stories and the different kinds of traditions, hadiths that have to do, that seem to parallel the Ebionites. If you know Robert Eisenman, who's done so much on James, uh, his expertise is actually not early Christianity, it's Islam. His PhD is in Islamic studies, hmm, Near Eastern know. studies. And he's done a lot on that. I think his dissertation might have even been on that. And then he became a Dead Sea Scroll scholar and worked on New Testament materials. But uh, Eisenman's well known probably to your, your audience. But I think they mainly disappeared by a redefining of what it is to be part of Israel. And we know it starts with Paul. Uh, from what we can tell, James would say, that to be part of Israel, you uh, undergo either birth or some sort of a conversion and join the Jewish people or the Israelite people, if you want to be broader. Uh, whereas Paul would say, no, faith in Christ makes you of the seed of Abraham. And the country Abraham promised is a heavenly country. And so you can see what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Augustine comes along and puts a cherry on the top of that cake by saying, well, actually, the church is the kingdom then, and the church is the new Israel, and uh, Isaiah is being fulfilled in the church. Right. And you begin to allegorize everything. And it's not that far from your preterism, Derek. It's a more Catholic form of it. But it essentially takes all of those elements that most people would read as referring to the nation of Israel and their history and reads that as applying, quote, spiritually. It's an odd word to use because I'm not sure what that means. You know, I'm going to apply that spiritually. First of all, I object to the term because it implies a uh, superiority, like you have a earthly interpretation or a literal interpretation you know it's pejorative but i have a spiritual interpretation it sounds like mine's higher or better right. when actually creating a world of peace and justice would be pretty spiritual i think wouldn't mind having it right now where the wolf was with the lamb and the lion and the bear were together and nobody harmed each other and the nations were not at war that could be right here on earth and it would be pretty spiritual if it could ever happen it does seem to be the goal of of uh, good people around the world that's what they say constantly you know why can't we have a world of peace and justice hmm. so uh anyway james i love you thank you so much for your time hey. The hard work you're putting in. I hope people will go sign up and join us for the upcoming Zoom this weekend. Um, I'm trying to think of this October 12, 79. What happened in 79? There is some stuff that happened, of course. Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. You're talking about the, they were, they were yeah. talking about like uh, going back up, uh, saying something about, I am the servant. Um, you will hear it appearing from New York City. A sun will rise, it will shine, and you shall see. Just but who is saying this? The the person who super chatted, Atif. Does he think he's it or he wants us I, to do it? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it sounds mm -hmm. like it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I have a file, Derek. Uh, maybe I should teach a course on this. Messiahs I have known. I have a file on Messiahs, like people that have written me. Mm -hmm. I get five, six page handwritten letters and uh, they tell me 
everything from, I'm, 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 I'm Jesus to I'm this, I'm that. Right. And as Jonathan Smith once said, paraphrasing, I think Gershom Sholem or somebody, he said, you know, the study of magic is nonsense, but the study of magic is scholarship. So lots of these, you get it? So yeah. lots of lots of these crazy ideas, I think, are pretty crazy. People in various mental places claim to be these different figures and so forth. But there's actually a way to study those kinds of things to try to understand what are some of the psychological states of mind that lead to that. And it actually can be quite enlightening, not making fun of the people. I'm not really going to do a course on it, but I've got a thick file I call my Messiah file. I've got it over here in a box. It's probably over 200 letters I've collected over the years from what we would call crazy people. And right. that's not necessarily insulting. Remember, Jesus, the relatives go, he's crazy. Get that guy right, out of here. Right, right, right. It's just like somebody that thinks they're the person. You know, I my my list of engagements with people who have written me are going to be – they're going to pale in comparison to yours over the years. But we kind of talked about this once offline. But so like, you have quite a few? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lot. I get – look, I very openly say I come at this kind of – you know, coming at it with a naturalist angle of understanding these religions. I don't think there's any magic. I think they're man-made. I think that humans have convened con, – you know – made them and, and adapted them and molded them. And I think that there, a lot of this is in the mind. That doesn't matter. People see my heart. They see that I'm a human who cares. I get these emails about how I'm chosen. Um, mm. You know, like, like you're, you're, mm. you'll see, you know, like there's just all these things and that there's some messenger and, you know, there's always something there. And um, I get this all the time from people. And then sometimes mm. I get these like, death threat type like i'm coming to crush yeah. you, you enemy serpent's head devil worshiper yeah i had a lot of those during waco in fact one of them i had to turn into uh, the fbi because it was a, a package that was ticking and i had to go pick it up at the campus <laughs> post office and they said dr Tabor, this is ticking do you want us to call the authorities and i said absolutely and somebody had made me a clock you know, carved it out of wood and had, you know, the back of really nice. I, yeah. I think I put it in my office for a while, but they left it running. So that when it arrived, it's like, <laughs> and I, they didn't mean any, they didn't mean anything by it. Now I had, my favorite is, uh, I think this is harmless, but I did turn it into the FBI at the time. Cause I was getting a lot that was from helping work with David Koresh on the Waco stuff, which I did, you know, trying to get him to surrender and so forth. Yeah. And some people loved it, help, you know, some people love David Koresh for his sort of militant anti-government stance. Right. But other people, of course, say, well, you're a cult apologist, you know, you're trying to defend some crazy person like that. And this one was, um, let's see, something like, uh, you're definitely headed for the fires of hell and it's going to be hot and it's going to be forever and ever. And I will do all I can to make sure your trip comes soon. Yeah. That one I took is like, a threat. I'm willing to face, you know, whatever judgment there might be, but I'd rather not be hurried along before my time, if you know what I mean. So that one scared me a little bit. I, you ever, if you ever want to laugh, there's a video on YouTube to to Richard Dawkins, as we all oh, know. Oh yeah, it, it's that. called "Love Letters from Christians." Yeah, <laughs> I've seen that. That is, I laugh so hard. Like they yeah. are so hateful. It's it's mm -hmm. like you gaytheist. Like they call him a gaytheist, and, and like all this, they're trying to be derogatory. I can't wait to see you cook in God's broth from my watchtower in heaven. And it's like. <laughs> What is wrong? Oh, anyway, it I can I be bad, and yet so many people have been um, spiritually inspired and strengthened. Think of Albert Schweitzer and people like that. Uh, right, 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 right. By by uh, studying religion, so. <laughs>
Absolutely. We had a couple more here. People uh, last minute. Festron Boyle says, why aren't more efforts made to hunt for the Copper Scroll treasures? Seems important. Oh, well, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, there's some new material on that, actually. Shimon Gibson has a new article out that's just coming out. I'll cover it. In, it's not covered in the course because I just got the article recently. He wouldn't let me put it in the course, but that's the archaeologist I work with in Israel. And uh, he he has a different interpretation. I'm not going to go over it now, but uh, a lot of efforts have been made. So far, nothing has turned up. I do take it as a serious treasure list. And I think a couple of the locations I'm pretty sure uh, we can pinpoint. But the main one which is the Cave of the Column, it's called, uh, that's up near Jericho. That I think we can locate, but unfortunately it's collapsed. And the cave that it talks about with two entrances, uh, it actually is so covered with rubble. And it's remember, it's in the occupied territory too, so you'd have to get unbelievable permission to do this. And I don't know if the Israelis or the Jordanians or the Palestinians are into some one going out with bulldozers and looking for buried treasure. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Right. But uh, uh, I, t I take it seriously. It's a very, very mysterious document. And I think one of the what we could do in one of the Zoom meetings in the future want people to get the main scrolls under their belt, so to speak, first. Mm -hmm. So we just don't go for the exotic, you know. And then maybe we'll do a whole uh, session because I can email students anytime and say, hey, we're going to meet. Next Zoom meeting, we're going to talk about the Copper Scroll. Here are three articles, Joan Taylor, Shimon Gibson, whatever. Uh, let's talk about it, you know. Uh, and I do, I do that in my... Um, Patreon group. My Patreon group is kind of like a, a Tabor club, you might say, right. in the sense that it's, it's not so much to raise money because you get the same thing even if you give a minimum amount. Uh, but it's more to say, it's sort of like Bart charging to read his blog. He's just trying to keep people away that are just surfing around like, I'll trash this guy and I'll go here and trash mm -hmm. this guy and that. There's a lot of that. So yeah. my Patreon is more a segregating way of getting people together that really want to talk about this stuff with me. And I meet with them also once a month. And that group, um, we often take topics like that. You know, just take a topic, do some readings, and then talk about it. We're, we're Right now we're doing DNA, the new DNA studies that we've inaugurated of the bones in the different Jewish ossuaries. So pretty exciting stuff. Thank you. That's going to get delayed for a while, but <laughs> JC yeah. says love for Dr. Tabor. Thank you, JC. Uh, Atif said, don't be scared. You are my brothers. I created the kingdom system in an app. That's what's releasing in New York city. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that feels a little bit less threatening. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so he's a gamer. Maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. seems more like, just created an app. I don't know okay. exactly what that all entails, but I imagine an app on your phone kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then Grace says, would you be okay with going to hell? <laughs> um, yeah, well, <laughs> I would say let's, let's talk about the word hell and the word Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom, and what it meant, uh, especially in the Roman period. And it actually wouldn't be too bad because it's kind of where we all go anyway. You don't torture garbage and bodies have to be either uh, cremated or buried because they'll rot. And in the older text, that is hell. Did you know that uh, when the King James was translated and the Apostles Creed during the Elizabethan period, remember where it says Jesus descended into hell mm -hmm. and on the third day rose? Right. Everybody like, oh, my God. He went to hell. And that's because the word hell in English was hull, like that, which is our word whole. And you have other texts of the period where somebody said, 
I put my potatoes in hood. Like they put them in the hole for the winter. And it actually mean, meant the grave. Bart Ehrman has a book on this, right? Talking about heaven and hell. So the original meaning of hell, even in English, was a hole, a grave. Sheo is a grave, basically. And uh, so I guess I am going to that hell because I, I think humans die. There are two things I think about humans, Derek, and I'm going to apply this to you. You were born of a mother and a father, egg and an ovum, or not an egg, sperm and I said an egg and an ovum. You'd be kind of weird. I would look weird. Right. Let me start over. <laughs> you were born of a mother and a father, a sperm and an ovum, and you're going to die someday. Mm -hmm. And I don't think those two affirmations take away anything from anybody, including Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, I think those affirmations make us real. So, right? I mean, you do know you're going to have an apotheosis, right? Like, that's that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I have studied it enough. I wrote, <laughs> a, I wrote a book on Paul's ascent to paradise. So. Yeah, I've got it. Somewhere, Somewhere in all my chaos here. Uh, they'll find it. Don't worry. Yeah, go go to Amazon. Um, Constellation, uh, last one, please, everybody. I got to let James go because he's definitely got a day ahead of him. I've got some work to go do, too. I'm creating. Yeah, I got to go follow the news. I, I'm in touch with so many friends in Israel, and there's so much going on right now. And I've exactly. So many, uh, Question for another day. Was violence used between competing Christian groups after the death of Jesus? Murder tactics and confiscating plus destroying their literature. Well, after the death of Jesus, when you get... I, I certainly don't think there was any record of violence in the first few decades. But when you get into the second and third century, the rhetoric becomes so violent that you have to wonder. And then we do finally have tales of uh, competing Christian groups that are so damning each other to hell that you get that kind of idea that I mentioned where like you're going to hell and I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Right. You know, one of the, if you think about it, probably the craziest thing about Christianity that could have ever developed is after Constantine particularly, that you could have a Christian army. Think about that. Think about it. It's, it's just astounding. A Christian army that would go kill in the name of Christ mm -hmm. and literally slaughter masses of people, men, women, and children. You know, the Muslims, uh, Saladin was welcomed by the Jews. Why? Because the Crusaders had killed all the Jews and all the Muslims. So we think of Islam as, oh, it's a very militant religion, which it can be, of course. Mm -hmm. But you should uh, talk to Shimon Gibson. He's an expert on the Crusades. Our site we're digging in Jerusalem, we've uncovered really important Crusader ruins and what the siege of Jerusalem was like during the Crusader period. And uh, the way Shimon puts it, my, my, he's really my colleague, my teacher on this stuff, because he's an expert. Uh, you can Google him, Shimon Gibson. He's amazing. Probably one of the best archaeologists in Israel. And he says, um, he says, nobody was spared. Like the local population in Jerusalem when the Crusades took over, you kill them all. Uh, because basically Muslims and Jews are unbelievers. So it was a kind of a reverse thing. But uh, Jews had a hard time under certain periods of Muslim rule. There's no doubt about it. But generally, they were allowed uh, a minimum of rights, whereas Crusader Jerusalem, they're, on, they're Christ killers. So why Convert would, or die. Yeah. Why would you let a Christ killer live, and why aren't they converting? So Yeah, I remember, uh, I think it was a scholar named Shelley. I can't remember her last name. She wrote a she wrote like a deep commentary on acts and she actually pointed out fourth, fifth century. I can't remember the historical situation exactly, but a group of Christians, this is post, you know, they've yeah. become militant go and actually massacred a Jewish uh, community because they read acts. Mm -hmm. Acts is so clearly bent on every time a Christian is accused. It turns out to be a Jew's fault, like mm -hmm. a, a non-Christian right. Jew. And so it's so bent on, 
well, Paul was actually innocent. Guess whose fault it was? These lying Jews who keep instigating to try and like get them killed. Turns out it's them. And so that that, that propaganda in Acts is so powerful. Yeah, you know, they're very good books on Christian anti-Semitism that yeah. have been developed and you can find them easily there. They're pretty hard to read. They're pretty hard to read. Yeah. But isn't it ironic that uh, a religion that started with what we call Sermon on the Mount stuff, you know, love your enemies, uh, do good to those that persecute you, would turn out to have armies that like chop heads off people or the Inquisition. If anybody, I mean, we're just wondering here, we got to go, but yeah. if anybody uh, has read or seen the film The Disputation, which is a debate in Spain, I believe it's in the 1400s, between Pablo Cristiana and the rabbi, and the rabbi was forced to debate uh, the truth of Judaism over against Christianity. And it was made by the BBC. You can still find it like bootleg editions. I think it's even on Amazon. It's not mm -hmm. real high quality because people keep copying it. And, but they showed it on the BBC and it caused such a stir they took it down because the, the rabbi wins the debate basically, for sure. And Pablo Cristiano is the Christian and he used to be a Jew and converts to Christianity. And anyone who watches, these are transcripts of the actual trial called the disputation. And when you watch it, you just go like, whoa, wow, the, the Jewish guy won. He like refutes everything that the Christian priest said. So that's kind of <clears throat> tough. Check that out. And then JC says, eat some, some raw saffron. It will help. Oh, wow. The saffron coming out again. There you go. <laughs> James, any final words from you? Before we see this guy on, well, I hope to see people in the course and in subsequent courses. And I want to commend you, Derek. Uh, flattery will get me everywhere, maybe, but or nowhere. But I think you have created uh, with your wife, whom I know well, and really appreciate for her amazing work. Yeah, uh, you've created and your family that supports you. You've created a community on YouTube that is like no other. And uh, you're only starting, really. You're only starting. I don't even know where you're going to go. <laughs> but you really have because I don't know anybody else that is brought together for the common person. Uh, all of these amazing professors and researchers that usually would only be heard by people in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. And you've had some of them on countless times. So they become familiar and gotten them to offer courses and so forth. So I guess what I'm saying is you're, you're kind of the Bart Ehrman of the uh, people. <laughs> There's Bart as a scholar has represented at least a certain mainstream scholarship, probably to a wider audience than anybody of our generation. But I think you have done that with, in your own way from the other side, meaning you're in the audience listening. Right. And you've said, well, I have a lot of people with me. Can we come in together? And I think it's phenomenal. I hope people will keep supporting you to do That's an amazing compliment. I really every possible thing. Well, and you're always so fair with people. You're so fair with people. Thanks, James. Yeah. I really do appreciate you and the courses that we've done. I'm hoping more people sign up, more people will continue to get your books. And I always and get great push, compliments. I want to push another course, uh, Robin uh, Faith Walsh's course. You know, Robin comes across sometimes as maybe even shy or unassuming, you know, like she's – a younger scholar and she said to me once god you've written 10 books i've barely written one and you know you know so much and i think god you know as much as i do on a lot of things but uh she has a course i believe and yeah. i'm not just trying to promote her Ryan's course. Getting her second course ready which is on the gospel yes. yeah oh, good. yeah but scholars like this too that oh, like you've had the crossons and you had the dale allisons and the Paula Friedrichson, Elaine Pagels, should I go on? You know, people people that ever, you've had Bart, you've had just about, 
but you also have had younger scholars that otherwise would probably not even be heard. Hmm. And yet this new generation of scholars, um, they're standing on, on Miller as another one that you've promoted a lot that don't get the attention that they need to get. And yet the work that they're doing is just astounding. And I don't know anywhere but you where people can, like, you can't go to Florida and sit in Robin's classroom. <laughs> exactly. You can take a course from her. James, me she and Robin. Amazing. In her you're, you're, I love that I lived near you because you actually inspired MVP courses to even birth itself into something. I was like, how can yeah. we, you were the first guy that I was like, I had already started this weird thing that nobody was doing. And that was get on a plane, bring your backpack equipment, fly right. to these people, sit in their living room and look weird, hey, to their kids and go, I'm going to spend eight hours harassing. I love you sitting on the couch with Cross and to me, Cross and the wisdom and that and the goodness of his spirit and everything and the ethics. And you got him talking it. about his story once. It, it's so funny because you're le literally sitting on a couch. His feet. And you're here and he's here. <laughs> and it, it's so weird. It's just amazing. <laughs> like fireside chat with Dom Cross and wow. <laughs> well, he was so cool. We went and got, you know, coffee, hung out. He's a funny guy. Like, mm -hmm. but all of that evolved into, hey, James, can I come to your office? By the way, for those who've never been to James's office, <laughs> it is like, it's like a little museum in a way. And so mm. I get into your office. We're sitting there. There's ossuaries. There's ancient this is not. This is just the room at home I use because uh, I don't want to drive to the office all the time. But, yeah, it's a pretty cool office. It was really cool. Yeah. You started that, and I saw it, and I went, you know what? Um, let's do this more. And so then I flew to see Robin, and then I flew to go see um, uh, Delcy Allison Jr. up there at Princeton. Then I flew and I flew and I flew. And now we're even flying scholars in Dennis McDonald. And also oh, Dennis, uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis and I go back a long way. And we've had, we had a couple of really good encounters in Europe once at a conference where he, my late son, David, who passed away four years ago, was there with us. And I have a picture mm -hmm. of Dennis and David and I and my other son, Nathan, sitting around in Vienna, Austria, and my boys just loved him so much, you know, like, oh, it's one of dad's friends. It'll probably be boring. <laughs> and so I got to know Dennis personally. And then over the years, I've studied his material. I've got his big magnum opus over there on, on the table, which I haven't read yet completely. My problem is just, you know, I'm 77 years old and I feel like I'm 30 and yes you do <laughs> i really do and uh i'm very you were thankful. out running me and ryan when you were here i was like <laughs> i yeah, can't keep well. up with you but anyway i just there's so many things i want to do still that i hope to do but i have to really prioritize yeah like there are 20 books right now that i would die to read but i have to decide which to go first <laughs> you know like what because I also have a certain track that I'm on in terms of, like I have tons of Dead Sea Scrolls stuff that I want to read. Right. I'm like here with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but there's all this new material coming out. So mm. I can't just read all day. So, <laughs> James, this has been a, a wonderful little just having fun, expressing ourselves. Okay. I hope we didn't bore people. And, you know, I hope nobody thinks. God, those two just sit and flatter each other for half an hour. That's not very helpful. But it's it's history, though, James. What, yeah, what's happening is history. it's going to be on YouTube, and I mean every word of it, and I know you do too. And, yeah, and I got to meet your family too, and so. But James, Ryan, I just want to brag on Ryan. Ryan, to me, is almost like a tech genius. I didn't yes. know this side of her. Like she was working on Bart's courses a little bit, helping mm -hmm. him with some. And I think like, how would you know how to do that? And she goes, oh, I just like click around and figure it out and this and that. So I know Derek always says the queen of myth vision, but believe me, she's probably up. I know right where you are now because I've said it that day. Yeah. She's probably up the stairs there uh, pecking away at that 
desk she works at and doing just amazing things. She's my angel. Well, look, right at the, look at this course. Look at this course. The beautiful design, the heading. Yeah, let me pull that up. She, she did all of that. Well, actually, I don't have the course open. Let me. Yeah, she did all of that. So we give her. And you know, the other thing, sometimes people who aren't as tech savvy, this is amazing to me with, I'm going to brag on her. They're not very tech savvy and they write things like, uh, well, I can't find, I got the link to the course, but, and I tried it and it doesn't work or something like that. Yeah. And then. Now, don't show the Zoom link. Somebody might copy it. So Okay, I got a Zoom. Okay, there you go. Not, might not be there yet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, and and somebody like, well, I made a password, but it doesn't work now. And, you know, people get mixed up on things like this. Right. Did you know that she, you probably know this, she will write like an individual student personally an email and say to them, okay, what did you do? Tell me exactly, you know, and help them get back on the course. Cause people, uh, what kind of uh, personal service is that? And I know she's very busy. But. Uh, I'm gonna tell you, just to be very frank, there's no words that, that express this. I mean, I'm saying them, but they don't do justice. I could not do what I do I would not have myth vision. We would not have our second channel. We wouldn't have courses if it weren't for her. Um, yeah. right. we, we do the edits. Like you said, everything that Bart puts out from his YouTube to his courses to everything, we edit those. We, we do all that for him as well as our own materials. Mm -hmm. We are trying to grow that. And if it weren't for her, honestly, I might could sit in front of this camera and talk about a book I read. And that's about as much out of myth vision you'd get. If it weren't for her, our children, we have three boys. I just wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. Well, you guys are exercising, trying to eat right, stay healthy. So this is all good. Okay, everybody. Take care. All right. We'll see you. Thank good you so day. much. Mm -hmm. Never forget, we are myth vision. <laughs>